Yes, hello, folks. Welcome to the weekly Manchester United podcast. I'm your host, as always, Phil Brown, joined with my regular co host, the excellent James Rhodes. James, how are you doing, mate? Yeah, doing pretty well today. And how about you? Not too bad, mate. Not too bad. A uh, 3 0 win over the weekend, which is uh, an away win, something that's not to be sniffed at. We don't get many of those. So uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> the weekend's always better when you experience something like that. Yeah, yeah. It, uh, it starts it off nicely, especially being the early, early, early kickoff, earlier even for you than for me by an hour. But uh, it's nice when that happens and you can kind of just in enjoy the football the rest of the weekend without too many concerns. Yeah, I mean, can, um, kick off here at 4.30 in the morning. Do you know how difficult that is? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> um, with, uh, with, without the help of a few things, but nonetheless, yeah. in my twilight years, I am able to manage it. So, um, but <laughs> about 12 or 1 later on that day, I'm just so tired. <laughs> yeah. Um, Go, long gone are the days when I used to be able to do that so easily. I remember we used to go to Vegas and go out on a Friday and we still partying on a Sunday. Now I go to Vegas like by midnight I'm in bed, what you know, getting room service, watching TV. <laughs> Jesus Christ. That's the way. That's Hi, it's the all way. changed. <laughs> you know, but um nonetheless, very, very good win. Yeah. Very happy. Um yeah, I know Southampton, not great. All, all the regular caveats, but you know, don't tend to win. Uh, away from home, keep clean sheets, score a good few goals. Uh, Delect getting on the goal score or school scoring um sheet, which was very positive. Of course, Marcus Rashford scored a really good goal too, uh, yeah. which will give him enormous confidence. Um, other factors good to see uh, Garnacho score. Um, yep. Yep. and of course, uh, I, I think uh, I thought Mazarui had a really good game too. I think uh, Agarty came on, you know, Agarty came on the last 20 minutes or so. And I think that uh, he's going to be one of those players you don't notice a lot because he does everything so well. And yeah. uh, three now one, very happy. Uh, what was your take on the game of the weekend? Yeah, it was it was good. I I think there's um you know there's always as as is the point things to things to discuss about it, positives and negatives to it. Um, it's it's good. Like what was really good about it, mm. I think, is that. If it had been flipped the other way, you know, uh, where we were good for the first 60 minutes and awful for the last 30 minutes, it might have been worse. <laughs> mm. But, uh, you know, the first 30 minutes were worrisome, right, against a pretty bad Southampton team, uh, that they were pretty dominant. And um, they were able to to pretty well control the game, pass around us, move around us, get through they got a penalty you know onana saved it i thought that was a huge positive onana has been somebody very much criticized this year so far and after the liverpool game you know for being just far too easy and i think people were asking is there ever like does onana ever like bail us out you know like just bail us out of a goal when when we need bailing out and he did and he showed up and he did and he saved that penalty he's been he's had a good record for us at saving penalties so far um you know in, in in these games so that was a positive that he did that you know the the reasons we were getting outplayed were unfortunately a lot of more of the same the midfield was really overrun really empty hard to deal with uh the change to Ericsson is an interesting one because yep is a there's a lot of good and a lot of bad that came with it I think he was probably our best player with the ball in in the game I think he was brilliant in possession and we know he can do that. He's he's calm, he's focused, he he he's very he's much more um I don't know what the word for it would be. There's a lot less variance with Ericsson that you get, right? Compared to some mm -hmm. of the other players where it's a, it can be hit or miss, even even Bruno and such. Ericsson's very, very calm uh on the ball and what he does. And I think that without him, we probably don't come back from that game in the same way, not that we were losing, but come back into it and start to really take hold. Um, but at the same time, he, you know, his, the lack of legs out of him defensively was a big problem. Mm -hmm. It was Gallo very exposed on that left side, which certainly he, he was, you know, struggling on that left side. Um, but so the negatives were there in the first 30 minutes, the things we've seen before with the midfield being open, with teams being able to run through us with all of that happening. Um, but the positive was after the penalty save, they bounced back, right? They, they didn't stay in the gutter on it. Um, they really went forward 
and took kind of took control of the game and getting a couple goals in a few in six minutes, I think it was right. Uh, does wonders for the confidence and does wonders. And after that, they were on cruise control. I mean, totally in control of the game from 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 that point onwards, every single second of it. And you know, and I, I think there was really really smart performances from like Joshua Xerxes. I thought it was a mm-hmm. really, really good game yep. from him. And the type of thing you you sign him for, getting in there, dropping in the spaces and linking up the play, we haven't had anybody do it to that level in a long, long time. And I know someone like, you know, Ben Nistelrooy would be quite happy to mm-hmm. see someone doing things like that in the team at Striker. I thought it was huge. I thought he made everybody else better. Some of the things he was doing as a, you know, a very big six foot four, six foot five player. I mean, you don't see that kind of stuff out of players, you know, unlike, you know, since like Zlatan being able to manipulate the ball the way he does to to move it around with that kind of frame. Um, it's it's, yeah, it's badly cool. harder when you're that size, you know, like yeah. the, the, you have a low center of gravity. It's much easier when you're tall, lanky that gets. Um, it's definitely hard to have those intricate skills, but yeah, he's yep. still he is. He is. It's quite impressive. And yeah, so a lot of, a lot of positives, I think good things to take away. I thought all the attackers were good. Yes. You know, at, at that game of the weekend, I thought they were all good. And, you know, Rashford needed a goal pretty bad. Garnacho did too. You know, he, he had, he had a few really mm-hmm. good chances. He wasn't able to finish for one reason or bad luck or whatever, but he, he got his goal. Delict I thought was really good against Liverpool monstrous against Southampton and got his goal as well. And, that after you know all the criticism over the international break, which is which is a bit over the top, um, regardless, uh, really strong from him. But he's a he's a really mentally strong player, so it's not really surprising to see that as one of his better traits. And yeah, so so positives to take away. You know, it, it, there's some this was this and tomorrow's game against Barnsley are kind of the easy games, so to speak, for United. Mm-hmm. But they're the ones they need to get some confidence and to get rolling a little bit because it's it's uh, it's not always going to be that easy. Um, you know, I think that it, you're quite right. Like the first 30, 35 minutes was really poor. Yeah. Concerningly poor. And yeah. I'm getting angry and angry as I'm watching it. And um, <clears throat> everything changed on that penalty moment. And I think yeah. where you have to give United credit is, you know, if you, you, you go back to the Newport County game last season, where they conceded 22 shots from open play. Yeah. <laughs> after they... Give after they uh they you know the the, the penalty save from Monana never said something didn't have another shot on goal. Yep. Yep. So in that sense you have to give them credit. Um you know it's not with United you can never feel confident that this is a turning point because you've been we've been here so many times before and all you can really say is <clears throat> this was a good win. It was a confidence building win. It was a result you would have taken before the game. There was lots of individual positives in the game. Um, you can focus on the negatives if you want, of course. Um, and they're not to be dismissed. They have to be taken into consideration because if you needed were playing a better team in Southampton, that game would have been gone. Yeah. Um, but, but you know what? They weren't. And all they had to do was beat the team they were playing. Yep. And so um, they they came back. They, they, they scored good goals. Um, maybe when I'm still looking at that midfield and going, Manu, the whole midfield was booked. Now, I think Stuart Atwell was given stupid yellow card, right? So we got, we were felt- getting penalized like for that rice, you know, it was like they're trying to prove of a point course. about rice's red card and saying, Well, if you if you touch the ball after the whistle, you're getting a yellow. And you, the thing I don't understand about it is, and I know all fans feel this way about their team, but I've seen so many instances of where I've seen you know the Casemiro road grab where he was sent off yep. and we went over the top of the ball and I've seen them happen so many times now that they don't result in that yeah I, Timber had the same thing in the Tottenham yeah, exactly. game. He, went, he went over the ball right into his leg no no, no red Whoa, and that's the, the part that frustrating for fans is like I understand subjectivity it's hard to get complete alignment amongst human beings you're just going to get diff- different uh, opinions different viewpoints i totally understand that but these are the easy ones right yep. these are the ones where there really shouldn't be any divergence i mean if the, the, there should be common agreement that this is a red card this isn't especially yeah. if you're uh-huh. red, yeah. right where to me it's like okay you know that's you know there, there's no 
that's a red card in any ground up and down the country. Doesn't matter. Everyone knows yeah. that. But it just there's just no consistency to that part. And that's the part that's frustrating because it's it's very you, you know, Cabby Manny has been booked every game this season. Right? Now is that a consequence of um, him being isolated? Is that a consequence of the, the ridiculous nature of how we give yellow cards? Is that something to be concerned about? Maybe the game in, against it happened was, and I mean this with the, you, you, this is the biggest compliment, like one of the biggest compliments I could pay me in is that might have been one of his lower key games yeah. that I've seen play for United. And um, I just hope there's, I hope he doesn't play against Barnsley. Yeah, well, he's look, I mean, sure he gets rested enough, James, and I just feel like yeah. he's played. You know, he played in the Euros. Yes. You know, he played. He played against Adam for England. You know, and then he, he's playing again at the weekend. He's playing f- more or less. You know, he's starting every game now for United. Yeah. And that midfield, you have to cover a lot of ground. I just hope he's yep. not experiencing yep. that little burnout dip where he needs a rest. Yeah, well, I think it's a con- what you mentioned is a is an interesting point because it's sort of a a unique discussion around United, and I think it it highlights not to focus on the negative, but on something that does need to change. Kobe Mainu leads the whole Premier League in interceptions; he has thirteen. Next highest is eleven with Virgil Van Dyke there, right? Interesting. Um, yeah, he's leading the league now. United are also first in number of tackles and first in interceptions. And this has been going around in a stat recently and presented as a good thing. It's not. It's actually a bit of a red flag because the team in second is Everton. One of the what is if you're the Dallas Cowboys? What's that? <laughs> is if you're the Dallas Cowboys interceptions? Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, that would be good. We're play- it's the wrong sport. You don't want to be. You don't want to be leading the league in interceptions. Okay, if you go back each year, it's usually the teams getting relegated that are leading the league in tackles and interceptions because, of course, the good teams have the ball more. So they don't defend as much. That's just how it is. That's it, it's sort of the inverse relationship. Now that doesn't mean you have to be at the bottom. Here, man, I'm sweating like a jockey's balls. Hold on, I'll be right back. <laughs> um, no, no. So you know, because at the top of the list is United. At the bottom of the list is Manchester City, and in second you have Everton, and then you have Palace, who are having a pretty rough year and, and all so far, and all of that. So. Things have to be represented properly when, when you look at these to consider what is good and what's bad. And what it's what's bad is what it's telling us is that United are doing way too much in the midfield. You know, Liverpool and City are both in the bottom three in these numbers. And that's what you you want to be closer to that. You want to you don't want to be doing so much defending. This has been a problem United have had for a, quite a, for a few years now. It, and this is even predates Ten Hag. Because under Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, we would often be a bit settle in and we'd be defending and we were good at it. We, last year, we did the same. We were actually, we faced loads of shots, but we were pretty good at box defending or we would have given up way more goals than we did. Um, we don't need to be making, we don't need to be at the bottom because when you're playing an aggressive brand of football, when you're pressing, when you're doing that, you're going to, you don't have to be at the bottom we're never going to have the type of possession that Man City have. That's just un, un, unrealistic, you know. But we should be closer to maybe Liverpool, you know, in the in in the bottom half at least in this in this measure where we're not spending all game tackling. Kobe Mainum has probably been the busiest midfielder in all of England right now uh, as as a player. And, mm-hmm. and and that's good in terms of him becoming like one of these all action midfielders. And it's bad because it is a very easy way to get burnout. And we've see, we saw it last year. He was struggling. Those spaces having to do so much work. You don't want a player of his, I think, quality on the ball, his technical ability. We haven't seen it this year. We don't see him in the forward areas doing the things he was doing when he first came on last year, making goals happen, making attacks happen. I'm not saying he can't do it and he doesn't have good moments in games, but more often than not, he's caught doing so much of the dirty work that um, you know he's struggling. And so as to the yellow cards, it's just volume. The more you defend, the more likely you're going to get a yellow at some point, right? Because the more tackles you're putting in, the more interceptions, the more you're getting around. And, and that's my biggest worry is those are the warning signs that we're seeing in, in the team that we saw in the beginning where 
it's just too much. We still have to do too much to win the ball. We still lose the ball a bit too easily, and that way we're defending too often. Mm -hmm. um, we've conceded fewer shots. It would be hard to concede as many as we did last year because that was like one of the worst of any team in history. <laughs> but but uh, we're still in the bottom, I think, 10th or 11th in terms of the expected goals against category, these types of things. So it, it – that it's a bit of a, a warning sign, and I think Kabi is a little the marker for it. Now, Ugarte is probably going to help with that for sure as an individual because he's got the legs. He's going to do more of the dirty work, and and he's going to definitely. He's also a lot safer with the ball, so you're not getting all the transitions back and forth when Casemiro's launching it or someone's losing a ball. It, it will help, but it's kind of a warning sign, I think, and 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 the measure of what probably needs to change more than anything else. Yeah, I don't know the answer to that, to be honest. Um, yeah. You know, I, I I don't have a confident answer on that. Um, yeah. <clears throat> because um, it's obviously only been a few games. And yeah. you could argue, if you want to be really positive, United have had one bad performance this season. Because I don't think they were terrible against Brighton away. I don't no. think they were they, they obviously decent Almost against good. Brighton at home. Yeah. And really, after 35 minutes against Southampton, they were you know, yeah. de deserved winners. Um, you know, one of the things that I want to see United doing is when they get to 2-0 is really putting the, the foot in the paddle to get the third and the fourth. Because United are a team that's always vulnerable from 2-0. Yeah. I mean, you see, you've seen, <laughs> I'm sure Everton fans will know exactly what I mean, um, having done this up against Bournemouth and Villa. Yeah. United always have a mistake in them. Mm -hmm. Two 0 you never feel like a game safe. Even if it's like five minutes to go and something flies in, you just know that second one's coming before the final whistle. Somehow seven minutes of extra time will be found, injury yep. time will be found, and then you know it, th there's a second goal in there. If you need it, will always give you that chance. And so it's good to see Garnacho get the third goal. I would have liked to have seen that come a bit earlier. I know when I'm, I'm being spoiled here, but. That's what the, the best teams do. They put the foot in the, foot yep. the paddle and then they kill the game. And, you know, I'm even like, if, if I'm thinking about like Coventry in the semi final last season. You know, there's just, you need to find these unbelievable ways to throw games away. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, with 3 0 up in that game, three each within 20 minutes. Um, those are the things that you need to have to be much, much better about this season. But I just, I wish that Garnacho goal had came a bit earlier because it's, you know, I don't want to be uber critical of Ten Hag, but the fact that United never batter teams almost seems to me as if once they get that second goal, he seems more concerned about control of the game and yeah. seeing it out than going for third, fourth, and fifth. Because we've never won a goal by four games under Ten Hag, I don't think. Not I, yet I, since I, he's, I, he's arrived. I can't yeah. think of one, but. Um, yeah, I don't know. I've been being overly, overly critical. Let me ask you about uh, something that um, has been mentioned to me. How do I say this? By some people at the club who are connected with players. Mm -hmm. I'm sure the other says. Um, <laughs> but um, do you think it's appropriate for the brothers of players to be posted on social media? That their brother should be playing in someone else's position, or should be playing in this position, or should should be starting the game, or should be four goals, four assists, should be starting, should be playing here, should be playing here, should be playing. I personally, if that was if I was in that dressing room and that was some well, someone I was playing with, and their brother was play, posting that they should be yeah. starting ahead of me, and I would have a problem with. It. Yeah, I would too, and I think it is something that the club need to get a handle on. You know. Because it's, I don't see what positives come from things like that. You know, when when Pogba was around and his brothers used to pipe up all over the place, it was a problem. It caused issues, and it was at best a distraction, and at worst something that that was, you know, generally difficult. And you've, you, it's happened with family members and things like that before. I mean, it happened to Chelsea with Thiago Silva and his wife, and you know, posting things about Chelsea mid games and after games. And the thing is, is that it's not quite to that extreme level, but, but it, you know, and, 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 you know, is a, is a young kid essentially, but at the same time, yeah. it's something they got to get a hold of because it doesn't paint a good picture. If you're, if you have people presenting it, like 
it, it does nothing but stir up. Well, how do you know what is his thoughts and what correct. His, this is the problem? Is like, is it his close, thoughts or is his brother's? Yeah, exactly, you know, did exactly. his brother ask him to say? And yeah. you know, this remember there was an issue last season where Garnacho liked the post, you know, mm -hmm. and then had to apologize for it. And I just feel like I, I understand it's a bit difficult for United to impose control on family members because yeah. you know what really can you do? But I just don't think this is helpful for Garnacho. Yeah, and I, I agree with you. You know, his brother is obviously a young kid and maybe doesn't fully understand or appreciate and isn't doing it out of any type of you know malevolence or you know any type of cynicism. He is he's just young kid that doesn't understand implications. However, there was a post tweet last season. It was before Spurs away. And paraphrasing here, but it was a if you knew what we knew about how teams were the team was picked, you know, you would and Danny had to yeah. delete it. Yeah. Right? Because this was obviously the game where the Sancho thing happened and mm -hmm. um what have you. But um I just feel there's a bit of, there's a respect issue there. Yeah, that you have to be thinking about you know maybe I don't maybe this is none of my business. Maybe this is down to the manager, and maybe this is down to my my brother. I, I, I'm not I'm not like it's complicated. Of, it's like funny, James. Yeah, yeah. I just don't <laughs> think I think it's a bit naughty. Yeah. Because you're talking about someone else. I mean, if my brother was tweeting that I should be in someone else's position at work. Yeah, yeah. That you know and work with every single me, day. I, I would be a bit, I, I would pull up the guy and say, hey. Yeah, you know, can't don't, be, saying don't, like don't be causing problems with my teammates. Yeah. Don't be causing problems with people I work with. That's between me, the, my employer, and yep. I wouldn't appreciate if it was done on me. And yeah. I just think like that's something that yeah. short United should nip in the bud or at least have a conversation about that. Yeah, I, all I've seen is that when those kind of things happen, it stirs up more drama against the players the or yeah, the yeah. manager. Yeah, the players or the manager. It doesn't. It's not fair to either of them because um, it stirs up stuff against Ten Hag too, you know, and and gets people riled up about it. It gets you get into then things people making accusations about people being you know the manager being forced to pick players stuff like that that's also false totally incorrect. Um, there's just no there's no positives from it. And I do think it's something they should. Well, is there someone address. else doing it? Do you know? Is there someone else in his first team doing it? I don't, I is there don't someone know. else in? I mean, there, there are probably other Premier League players doing it. Like I'm, I'm, I'm not saying there isn't. I just can't yeah. think of anyone else. <laughs> right. I don't know if we know we don't follow other teams as intimately, no, but I don't know of any other situation where you where you have this. I mean, the closest we got was like Casemiro's wife posting pictures of uh, of his all his trophies after the little yeah, game. That's and, and that's just really, different. Yeah, yeah. That's like she's just backing her husband down, yeah, that's you know. More of a yeah, generic no, thing to me. Correct. Like, that's, right, that's not yes. specific. I think and it I was there's was nothing sure. wrong with that. It is that's that's yeah, fine. I, that's I, like I, the I, closest I, thing to this that we've seen. And yeah. That to me is not an issue, yeah. Um, but you know, at the same time, like Garnacho was poor against Liverpool, yeah, right? he was, and and he got the start. Ahmad, yeah. Ahmad has been better than him. I'm sorry, and I'm not saying he is better than him, but Ahmad has been better than him on the right, yeah, and that's just a fact. Yeah. Like when Ahmad yeah. came on against Liverpool, Mamet was probably United's best player, and that's how you keep yeah. it based. Yeah, agreed. And so, you know, when you're a top football club, mm -hmm. you know, if you're at Real Madrid or anything, you face exactly the same pressure. So, yep. uh, other thing that I thought was quite interesting was um, Ten Hag's point about Anthony. I'm not sure if you saw what he said today in the press conference. Yep, yep. Which, with Ten Hag, sometimes you have to be careful about, um, you know, overthinking what he says and sometimes he uses words um that uh are consistent with someone that doesn't have a subtle precise understanding of english so sometimes you try to say something and you don't mean it to sound as blunt as that but it was interesting to me that when he was talking about anthony 
It's about earning the right to play. It's about attitude and training. I don't know if he's specifically referring to him or just making a general point. It's about earning the right to play, and he has to do that. And <clears throat> there's no guarantee that that will result in him playing against Barnsley. It's still striking to me, James, that this is the second most expensive transfer in United history, and he's almost irrelevant. I would mm. certainly, I would love to see him recover, play, be exceptional, and uh, be a, a success. But this is probably the weakest point or the lowest point um, he's been at since he's come to Manchester United. Do you see any way back for him? You know, it's interesting because Ten Hag said almost the same thing a few weeks ago, and it was about Jaden Sancho, and of course, he's gone, right? And he was gone pretty quickly after that, and we kind of knew he was going to be gone. Ten Hag didn't really want him around. And I do, so I do think it's fairly telling. Do I think there's a way back for him? Yes, because I think that it is a team of um, that is picked on merit. If a player shows up and performs, they get picked. Ten Hag, maybe almost to a fault, has rewarded good performances at times over stability, um, has rewarded things like goals. You know, in players, they'll show up, they score a goal, they start the next game. You know, he's done that almost to a fault even at times. And I think that um, there is. But at the same time, you know, those I, I, the comments are somewhat meaningful because there were incidents last year about that in particular, about not having the right attitude, about uh, incidents when wasn't being selected, incidents coming back from international break and not being fit and things like that. It's a tough one. It's a really odd kind of situation, I, I guess, because you know for, for a long time, Tenog was very reliant on him. But once it flipped, I think he was very... You know, it, it, there's just I, I don't want to draw up things where, where they aren't there. But if you compare the celebrations after the League Cup win to the celebrations after the FA Cup between Ten Hag and, and his some of his former players, you can see quite a difference um, in just the approach to things, the attitudes, all of that. Just there's there's things to draw from that. But, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean. Is he going to get in over Amar Garnacho? No, they're both better than him. They're both performing better than him. One of one of the problems that he has, James, and I hate to say this, <clears throat> when Anthony plays, it's a reminder constantly of how much money was spent on him and yeah. how he is. Um, I don't want to say a liability to Ten Hag, but because he is failed, and I am I. I I don't like doing this. I, I really wish it had been successful. It had been successful, but when he's not in the team and he's on the bench, he doesn't play. You can forget about he, it. Yeah, it's yeah. he's peripheral, yeah. so you you don't yeah. spend time thinking about him. But when he's on the field and he frustrates a fan so quickly, you know, and there's such a difference between when Anthony plays out there and when Garnacho plays out there and when Ahmad plays out there, and one of the things that still sticks in my craw a bit with the was if you remember when he came on against Arsenal last season at mm. Old Trafford and yeah. his attitude over being asked to defend. And my yeah. kid, you haven't been anywhere near good enough in two years. This is not asking, you know, uh, Vinicius Jr. to play left back. Do you know what I mean? I mean I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, you can have that yeah. attitude if you want, but that has to be consistent with performances where it's like, hey, I've but that's rate. why he's not playing. Those incidents, yeah. they matter, you know. So this is what I'm saying. Like, yeah. you know, um, you'll you'll hear all the United players say, you know, I mean, I've, you've heard it from even Lissandra Martinez. I don't care where I play. You play me yeah. like here, here. I'll, I just want to play for Manchester United. I'll be on the field. And players don't really mean that. Literally, no, like, they have concerns. Yeah, of course, <laughs> but. It's the attitude. Do, okay, if I have to fill in here, do you hear what he, he Casemiro wanted to play center back? Cost him his yeah. play in Brazil. Yep. Right? Cost him, he was a Brazil captain. Right? He's a Brazilian captain and he loses the captaincy. He loses his place in the team. He loses his place in the Copa America. But he did it. Yep. And this is, but so to me, it's like before, if you aren't playing well, okay, your attitude is everything. Mm -hmm. Now, you have to be putting in extra training sessions. You have to be doing extra work. You have to be doing things 
on the training pitch to get you out of that slump, to get you confidence. You have to be feel confident hitting a football. You have to feel confident in finishing chances. If you can't do that in games, you have to do it on the, on, on the training pitch. Okay. Yep. And for me, Anthony is in a position where he's not just trying to save his monetary career. He's trying to save his career at the top level. Because if it doesn't work out for him here, you looked at the teams that were coming in for him on loan. They're the teams that are a level down or he's going to have to have wages compensated. And, you know, it, it's going to have to be, you know, uh, it, 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 it's going to be a decline. He's, he's in a position where it's about, do you have the heart to save your career? Do you have the attitude to save your United career? Um, because... I think with Ten Hag, Ten Hag may feel more comfortable if he, if Anthony wasn't there. So it's not a constant reminder of what he needed to spend on him and, and and how colossal that failure has been. I I agree, and and I think I'm you know Ten Hag recognizes that as well, you know for sure. And you know it's not doing any favors to for Anthony in that respect, unfortunately. But you know he really just has himself to to blame in that respect. He doesn't have himself to blame for the price, but he has himself to blame for his attitude and his performances and. You know, and so it's a tricky one because he's here and it's really unlikely United will get rid of him. Uh, it's very hard for them to, at least this, you know, through this season. We know that. Um, so, yeah. yeah but it, 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 it's a point worth matching to it's because I, I'm sick and tired of people. Oh, just sell him, just sell him, just sell him. United have released players for free. Yeah. It, it took a year to get a club. You know, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm the Marshall still doesn't have a football club right now. Yep. Where did we just sell? Why did we just sell? Why would you sell him? Because you yep. didn't buy it. Yeah. You sell him to who? Yeah. You know, and the player no has to move. accept the move, and it's there's yeah. money involved, and there's all sorts of things. I mean, it was tough to sell McTominay and Wambasaka, and they had buyers. It was tough mm -hmm. to sell them. It was still yeah. hard to get get them to move. They had to take a lot of convincing, even then. Yeah. Um, it's not that easy. They, they did. They got as many players as more, way more out, frankly, than I thought was possible. But mm -hmm. uh, you know, this will be like. A difficult one, yeah. So, uh, yeah, and again, like you say this with all sincerity, I really hope that he finds form, finds consistency to save his native career. We'd all be winners if that happened, but I just don't see how that's going to happen at this point. Um, be interesting to see if he does play tomorrow against Barnsley. Um, beyond that, United you know, have a difficult game away against Crystal Palace next week. Everybody remembers what happened last year. <laughs> sure. uh, this will be more of a test of Ten Hag, of United, and their progress, regardless of what happens against Barnsley. And this is the thing, James. United always feel like they're one defeat away from, you know, whatever positive run they go on. It always feels fragile. And yeah. I, I, I don't have tremendous confidence United will go to Palace and win. But it's a game that United really should be winning. And we should have confidence in any United team by this stage to go to Palace and win. Decent team. But this is the type of game we you know, have to be winning, in my opinion, um, if top four is realistic. And I, and I slightly disagree with Ronaldo when he said a United manager can't be saying they, 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 they can't win the biggest trophies. There's realism about where United are. Mm -hmm. But I don't I agree that any talk about not qualifying for the top four, if, if that was to come out of Ten Hogs' mouth, right, I, I mean, that would be, for me, unforgivable. That has to be the bare minimum target this year. And, uh, you know, to me, if that's going to be accomplished, you'll see it in games like Palace away. Yeah, agreed, agreed. Like, you know, we don't – there's games we can lose, right? Like we said, we can lose to Liverpool. We can lose to Arsenal. We can lose to City. Those are the games, you know, but these are the ones you have to win. These, these games you have to win. You have to be beating these clubs because, as you said, yeah, you know, we, we know we're not ready to win titles. We know that. You know, it's come out of Sir Jim's mouth. It's come out of Ten Hag's mouth. We know we're not ready to win titles. And, and frankly, I don't think anybody's expecting us to this season. And, and you know, I, and even Bruno said it, I believe, right? He said it before the international break. He said he knows, you know, we're not at that stage yet. Everybody does. They're all realists on this whole thing. They've had mm -hmm. the discussions with the, the hierarchy with everyone, where they're going, what they're doing, and and the multi-year plan to to get there. But in the progression towards that, these are the games that do matter. You have to be beating these Palace teams and performing well. You have to be, you know, 
I would just argue we pre- we we cannot lose to Tottenham at home again. You know, uh, in in the in the next Premier League game after that, we can't lose that that game and and have things fall back down and say there's another team that's in a big to me in quite a transition. Their second season of Postecoglou, mm-hmm. you know, their net transition away from the whole Kane era. There's no excuse for them to be better than us. Okay, they finished above us last year. They should not finish above us this year. And haven't been that good yet as of yet this season. So those are the games where you say that's where we need to see progress. Those are mm-hmm. games we should win. Palace away, Tottenham at home. You know, uh, then if you go into Aston Villa away, who are actually an excellent, excellent team, and you don't win, it's not a disaster. If you win these other two games well and you perform well and you're doing great. And but that's where the teeter totter is because if you slip in these games, then those each one continues to be that like that game is a disaster if it goes badly and we might scrape by or something and and that's where we need to get away from you win the 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 games you should and then it's not a disaster week in and week out uh so you know there's a there's an opportunity here for a good run and um you know barnsley crystal palace away 20 at home you know these are games you have to win because then you have the tough ones, Tottenham at home, Porto yep. away, Villa away. Mm-hmm. That's why you've got to win these because then you don't have to win every one of those. And it's funny. I mean, we, we went through it. We've had it for years where sometimes where we'd lose the easy games and somehow pull a win in the big game. But that doesn't help you really. Yeah, and at the end of the day, it's it makes you feel good. Anything. But you, you look at it and you're like, we're still nowhere. Because then we're, we're still wondering if we're going to lose – to the worst team in the league the next week. And that's what we can't do. That's why we would need to see change. There has to be, you, first of all, you have to build momentum and confidence. Yeah. Um, these yeah. other games become so much harder if you don't win these games. And even if you don't win these games and you go in the other games, the fact that you can't win the simple games renders the other ones relatively meaningless in terms yeah. of inferring anything. Yeah, Winning this, the easier games sometimes is, is harder. Yeah, because it's that's a better marker, I think, of progress. Well, I think like, sometimes what what an easier game is when you cut corners. Yeah. I don't have to do this, but I don't have to do this. But plus, you have to motivate yourself. You you know you're not playing against you know better players where you can lift yourself for a game. Where you know doing the simple things is sometimes the hardest thing in life, right? Right. And so yeah. you know this is if you beat Southampton, you know. What you're not gonna, you, you, people are gonna turn around and say, "Well, it's only said Hunton, right?" Mm-hmm. So sometimes when in the the easier games, the Barnsleys, you know, the yeah. Coventrys, right? Yep. Um, I mean, you look at the Cup semi final. United <laughs> made the final easier than the semi final. Yeah. I mean, how did they go out against Man City within a few mm-hmm. weeks of the result? Completely control them. I know Lissandra Martinez and stuff had come back. and um, Come on, it's, it was Coventry, yeah. 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 But, <laughs> uh, yeah, but, but but against, you know, this is this is the thing is, like, you have to have enough trust that your team yeah. is f- strong favorite against yeah. weaker teams. Not where I'm concerned this football team will lower its levels. Correct. Yep. To match the opposition because they don't feel the need to win those games. This happens yep. a lot, to be fair, at the back end of seasons where yeah. teams start to lose belief that they can accomplish things. Where you know the if you're sitting around seventh or eighth, you already know you're not finishing fourth, so it's yeah. you know difficult to get that you know monster mentality. I suppose whenever the games are relatively meaningless, you can't have that now. Okay. Yeah. I mean, everything's still on the table. This is a, a test of who you needed, of the 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 players, the 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 coach, the the whole setup. And what I will say is that players at United now have no no more hiding place. If they look at what mm-hmm. happened this summer, the yep. threshold now between being moved on and being kept is completely different. The yep. evaluation process of whether you get kept or not. Is completely different. That has nothing. In, of course, the, the the financial prudence matters, but it's more about your levels as a footballer. Yep. And that's about how you train every day, how you live every day, or you know how you sleep every day, it's, and that determines whether you play or not. So, to me, I think um, they're being held to a, a different standard. So, I, I do expect that um, 
their baseline of where United can drop to will significantly increase. Uh, so I do think they'll beat Barnsley. I'm less certain about Crystal Palace. <laughs> well, it'll be more of a marker, but it's that word that you said baseline is the exact word I was thinking because that's what we want to see as fans, right? Because we've we've seen the variance, right? You beat City in a final, but you get dominated by Crystal Palace. Like that means your the window is huge and you yeah. never accomplish anything consistently and regularly with that. It's better to raise the baseline up where you know week in and week out we're going to put in this minimum standard of performance and then you start to try to push upward higher and higher and higher and you see that with the good teams city you know arsenal now for the most part um you know liverpool for quite a while there that that's what they would do you know the baseline was good the baseline was excellent every week you know what they're going to get um so that's what we want. I think we would all be much happier as United fans if we were seeing that. Okay. We have the, we know we're winning these games for the most part. We know how we're going to perform. We know how we're going to go in week in and week out. And now the progress is raising it from a seven to a nine when we need to, rather than wondering if it's going to be a one or a 10, you know, and anywhere in between. So I think that's what we all hope for. And, and that'll be the real measure of progress is what is your bottom, not what's the top, what's the bottom. So looks like uh, Sean Hoyland about to return. Uh, Hoyland's supposed to be is in the running for this weekend. Um, I would imagine if Luke Shaw has some availability for tomorrow, he'll be on the bench. Um, hopefully, Shaw can stay fit. I think people forget you know he has a metal rod on his leg. And yeah. uh, what this guy's been through <laughs> is unbelievable. Um, yeah. And we know we're not getting him fit for every week of the season. If you can keep him fit for half of the season, it will help him edit immensely. Um, you know, he's still for me the best left back at the club, no matter what. Uh Maserui, you know, is obviously someone we were told can play left back, but primarily plays right back because you know, double plays on the left. Um I still feel that that left back is a concern to me. If you look at the panel yeah. and stuff, Dallo isn't it's not one of the reasons why United wanted a left footed centre back was because when they slide for the ball, instead of sliding this way, they want them to slide away mm -hmm. from ball, away from goal. Yeah, and, you're on the wrong foot for the angle, yeah, basically. So, yeah. You know, and there and let me tell you something, there's, there are very few footballers, okay, that are equally adept with both feet. Okay. Mm -hmm. In fact, most footballers are really very one footed. It's very rare mm -hmm. to get that. So it's it's very rare to get someone that can play both left and right back equally well. They're either usually better at one or the other. United still, for my money, need. I know they're going to most certainly address this in the summer, but they need Luke Shaw fit James for at least half a season. Yeah, uh, that left back thing is, is still an issue. And and to be fair too, like when you take Dallo, he goes back on the right when Masrawi comes out. And gets an assist and, and gets the overlap and does what you want him mm -hmm. to do right off the bat. Mm -hmm. The natural footedness, the strong footedness helps in in 100%. both hugely in both areas. And we know how good Shaw is. Um, I still am curious why they walked away from making a left back signing in the summer because they, they were intending to for most of the time. Malasia is not back. I still don't really think he'll actually come back to the level. I'm not saying it's supposed to be close. But they? to what? You know, yeah, yeah, for sure. But to what? That's part of the issue is to what level of play does that mean? You know, I think I remember at to... one point someone said he was two weeks away, but. And um, then that was a year ago. Like 1973. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Right. Right. No, right. And he was about two weeks away. And, uh, no, seriously, I think some point from last season, someone said he was about two weeks they away. They did, yeah. It was in January. They thought he was close. And then. And then it just never happened. And now it's been nine more months, right? So it's a weird situation there. It's hard to bet on it. Shaw should be back soon, but not tomorrow, according to Ten Hag. And so it'll probably be later. But again, it's like he gets a lot of heat. I understand it. But like you said, you know, he has a metal rod in his leg. He's had this injury. And there's just a difference in the way that your body flexes and moves when you have that kind of issue versus how it is now you're just more prone to it but given that uh, I, I i feel like we will be in a market in january for a left back because i just cannot see 
uh, there's so little belief in my my heart and based on observation that Shaw will be able to be healthy, whether no matter whose fault it is or nobody's fault, it's just what it is, that he will be able to maintain that. And I think we'd be so much better with a left back, uh, a left-footed left back. I really the, do. The problem is you go for a left back, it has to be one that's at the very top of the market. Yeah. It's going to be your left back for at least the next five or six years. <clears throat> um, and you still have the issue of Luke Shaw and Molassi being on your books. Yeah. Uh, but I agree that like, in terms of um, you know it's necessity, it's something that absolutely has to be done. Um, did you get a chance to look at the United Financials at all? Yeah, I did go through a bit of them uh, when they first came out. There's there's um you know a few interesting things in there. Obviously, you know United the the the, the first thing is United first and foremost believe you know that they're in full compliance with PSR and all of that, even though it was quite tight. They had some really big losses, and essentially, I think for for anyone not getting it on that, they were able to deduct a very large amount of money from their losses for the difference in rules on PSR because you can spend on things like the academy, women's team, all sorts of stuff mm -hmm. like that, and deduct it from your losses. Those are things that are not charged against you. Um, and then it seems like they were also able to write off for the PSR calculations, a big chunk of the takeover expense. I, I don't particularly know why. Maybe it's the argument that without Jim Ratcliffe's investment, they wouldn't have been in compliance. And so the costs were a necessity for function and survival of the club and something like that, which is probably true, mind you, because if they hadn't gotten Jim Ratcliffe in and they didn't have that investment, 200 million lost in the last three years, that would be a... a, a disaster honestly a disaster so perhaps that's why but um yeah there's a lot to, to dig in on all of that <laughs> so i didn't get to look at this closely i'm really trying to make sure i spend as much time as possible on social media but it appears yeah. that um <laughs> the united reference of securities and um yes what exactly is going on there so basically what it says is that they want to sell off securities which could be a mix of things stocks and bonds and debts and all sorts of things like that and properties um, to raise 400 million in cash. Now, they haven't defined yet what that's for. There's supposed to be filings that will come later to, to say what that's for. It could be a general thing, uh, refinancing a debt or something like that. It could be for the stadium. It could be for almost anything. It's hard to know what the reason is for it as of yet. And they haven't published it. And when they do, it'll have to be in the stock exchange because United are public, they're going to have to make it very public what that's for, what the intent for those funds are, which should be following. I, I, I would assume pretty soon should be following, but one could assume that either they're looking to like, there's a couple of things that could happen, right? If we want to speculate just a little bit here, they could use that money to pay off almost a bunch of debts um, and dilute the shareholding a little bit. They could. Um, that could be something, and that would give United a lot more regular operating room. Um, now, where you'd be a little bit doubtful of that is that you'd basically still be asking the Glazers to further dilute their shareholdings. Now, they did some of that. To be fair, they did do some of that. The Jim Ratcliffe investment gave him uh, increased uh, ownership percentage, the, the $200 million that he's investing, gave him more ownership and the Glazers didn't take that money out of the club. That means that they gave up ownership essentially for nothing in return from a purely definition standpoint. Now, could they be doing that more? Uh, yeah, but I, I kind of think it's unlikely. And so I feel it's more likely going to be something used for investment, whether it be stadium or something like that, or, or I don't know. There's so many things that they could, they could do with this, but I think we'll just have to, to wait and see. The The best thing could be that it'd be used to be paid off debt and it'd be diluting shareholdings, but I severely doubt that that's the case, frankly. Yeah, I do too, as much as I would love that to be true. Um, yeah. But, and and uh, obviously one of the uh, – there's a, an account on Twitter um, that I follow, Ollie was right, and he's uh, supposed to be a sports lawyer. I didn't see how he made this connection. As I said, I'm trying to severely limit my time on there, but um, <laughs> he seems to think that this was indicative of further dilution of the Glazer ownership. 
um, on, I was on target to make sure they were out within two to three years. So um, hopefully, he is correct in making that um, and, and making that 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 parallel. Um, do you mind? Know it, it could be, you know, like there's there's there was definite signs when you look at the initial buyout from from Jim Ratcliffe and the deal that was put in place. There's nothing in there guaranteeing a buyout. We know that. Um, but there are a lot of things set up for like almost establishing the framework for another deal to occur in the future for Jim Ratcliffe to take over more of it. And one of the things that was a little bit surprising that the Glazers have shown a willingness to do, which if you'd asked me two years ago, I would have said, no, no way are they going to do that, right? Is to dilute their shareholding a little bit. However, you have to bear in mind that diluting their shareholding so far where they've, where they've, you know, they've lowered their ownership without taking money out um, has been specifically on investment in the club. Now, why would they do that is because they're betting well, we take Jim Ratcliffe's 200 million and we build a new training ground and we build a new this and we build a new that and we lower our shareholding by 5%. But the value of our shares is going to go up by more than that. So we're going to make money on that investment. So one could argue that this is, could make that connection and say, that's what they're doing now is um, is saying, well, if we, if we let 400 million go into the club for whatever reason and we dilute a little bit more, but it allows us to get the stadium project going and do all of that. Well, now when Jim Ratcliffe or anybody else comes to buy our shares of, of the ownership of the club, it's going to be worth, maybe we dilute 7% more of our holding, but it's worth 15% more, 20% more. And we make more money on the shares that we have and we have a better stadium and we have all of that. That is a possibility. There is a possibility that that's the direction that, that it could be going. Um, what I do think people have to recognize is that the Glazers and Jim Ratcliffe are working strongly in tandem on all of this. Okay. There's no, nobody's, there's not really a competition here. If they have a plan for future takeover, you know, they'll figure it out between the two, them. And it's not going to be like, it's not going to be like some, I don't think it's going to be like a, some sort of uh, clandestine activity. It's going to be pretty straightforward at, in that respect. Um, they also, uh, reason I, I say that there's some sort of plan here too is you know like they got together over the international break to um meet go over a lot of stuff uh to talk to have these meetings with some of the key people including football people as well um around the time of this so you can um, you can bet that there's been discussions and, and plans but my hope is that there's some dilution not for debt because that's not an investment that's not going to increase their shareholding value but maybe it'll be um a dilution of shares that allows for further upgrades to the club. And yeah, that'll make the Glazers more money in the long term, but it makes club more money. Club has better facilities, better stadium, all of that. So it, it's a win for everybody in that case. So, so we will find out soon. All right, Meaty. I can't think of anything else that's covering. Um, Barnsley, what do you think? <laughs> yeah. I think you have a win. I think, um, be interesting to see what players get a chance against Barnsley, who plays, who doesn't play. Yes. Um, positive news yesterday about some of the injuries, of course. Um, yeah, that we have no new ones. That's nice. <laughs> yeah. So Delect was largely cramp. Um, Martinez is okay. Uh, players coming back. Um, so um, be interesting to see what team gets picked tomorrow. I'd like to see Bayern Deer play. Um, yeah. I really don't understand why he doesn't play at all. Uh, I understand. Okay, fine if you want to do a win on in the first season because he just came in and you wanted to get him that rhythm, those games. But I hope we see, you know, Bayern Deer get a game. Um, we wonder if 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 Hamas will get some time. Yeah. Um, Weekly, you know, maybe. He, he, he got some minutes before. I never. Weekly. This looks make to me like a kid that's not ready for that level yet. Sure, he looks like a kid that needs long, like, yeah, there's a couple of levels that he needs to play at before he gets to that level. I would look, I mean, it sort of reminds me a bit of Amari Forson, where clearly Manchester United understand a good football from a bad one. They know that the yeah. players have talent. I've seen Wheatley play, you know, at a youth level, and he looks fantastic, but it just feels like. You know, I saw him on, on, on preseason tour and what have you, and I just feel like there's an. When you see players that are ready to play in the first team, you know yeah. they 
the, they're physically, sometimes physically stronger. They're more imposing. Um, I just feel like he's not quite there yet. But, mm-hmm. um, you know, if Anthony doesn't start tomorrow, I'd be very concerned if I was him. Because that's the game they should be starting in. Um, yeah. There's not much I, more opportunities than that. I, yeah. I, I imagine they'll start Garnacho. Yeah, for sure. Be interesting to see what happens in the central striking position once Holland is fully fit. What yep. ends up happening there? Um, I don't know how long Mason Mount is out for. Um, a couple more weeks, at least, as I understand it. Yeah, um, really frustrating. Um, hopefully, we see some of Luke Shaw tomorrow. Um, but uh, I think it, you know, it will win the game. But, um, you know, it's still a trophy that, that is important to United. It, I, I want to get to the point where it's the least important, but yep. we're not there yet. Um, I want to see Toby. Maybe we we'll see some of Toby Collier tomorrow because he needs a twenty. He needs that game time. So Garte uh, certainly needs to play with the team. I think. Yeah. Yeah, well, uh, I think Garte needs to start, and that's where you yeah. get. So, yep. um, but yeah, I think United will. I think United will win. Um, mm. and then, uh, Palace. That'll um, be a good measure. It's not that we got a lot of days in between Tuesday to Saturday. It's not the early game. Mm. It'll be. A, I think it's a good measure of of how well we play. Yeah, and, and that's the thing, James. Like that early kickoff is often overlooked. Like yeah, after the break, yeah. Games, Brighton and Southampton, they're far. Yeah, and early game after the international break, Klopp hated them. Yeah, and uh, it's uh, it's that's a that's a big factor. Yeah, and it, it is really considered. So, you know, I, thought, I think it needs to be taken into consideration that the weekend's win as well, because on that respect, the, one of the furthest away games, you know, down the south coast, very, very, it takes, of course, fans never considered in this. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that's a good win. But um, Well, another week, two games, I think afterwards, it'll be very telling uh, for us because it's very... Yeah. It, it, you need two good wins and two good performances, and I think it'll mm-hmm. actually start to feel like progress after that. Yeah, I think if they can get two wins, two good performances, um, you know, where let's say if you needed to beat Barnsley by a couple of goals, go get a, a, a decent one at Palace, maybe 2-0 or something like that, that would give them real substantive confidence, something very real, yeah. authentic, that has uh, granularity rather than just still feeling fragile where one defeat, one mistake can just yep. bring you right back. To grand zero again, but agreed. Agreed. Okay, man. We'll see. All right, James. Have a great week, mate. We will be back next week. Thanks to all of you for downloading the podcast as usual. For um, all your follows, likes, retweets, your comments, much appreciated. And we'll be back next week. Yes. Take it easy, mate. See you later. Have a good